Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jessica Rackley, the Environment and Energy Program Director at the National Governors Association, and are pleased to welcome you here today, along with my colleague, Timothy Schoenhoven, to our second um, Nuclear Learning Collaborative series. And we're doing a number of these different series, and I'll place in the chat um, in a couple of minutes where you can find the link to the recording um, and presentations for the first one, which was on the, the role of nuclear generation. Um, today's session is focused on advances in nuclear and future uses. And then we have a couple other sessions coming up. Um, one on December 6th that focuses on economics, jobs, stakeholder engagement. And then we'll be hearing a specific case study on um, January 12th. And we'll be sending de details out momentarily or within the next few days regarding the session on December, the week of December 6th. I think our exact date is going to be December 9th, a Thursday um, at 3 p.m. Eastern in the afternoon. So same time that we've been doing. Um, so first off, I wanted to thank our sponsors for this work. Um, the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy. Um, specifically, we've been working with Cheryl and Billy there, and you'll um, be hearing from them a little bit later today in the breakout discussions. Um, so this series, um, today we're going to focus on um, advances in nuclear generation and future uses. We're going to hear a few different, um, first from um, Ashley Finnan, um, and then we're going to hear from a panel of a couple of developers and utilities that will be talking about um, demonstration projects in particular and any kind of new opportunities for nuclear, including you know, timeline, um, cost, safety, and other types of um, concerns of policymakers. And they'll also highlight a little bit to you, I believe, about particular state um, policies, regulations, and other kind of um, ways that um, can benefit new advanced nuclear applications. Um, so today to our learning collaborative, it's kind of a two, two part type, um, one portion classroom type setting where you're gonna be hearing from experts. And the second half is gonna be small group state discussions where you can um, meet with your state peers that are working on similar issues and kind of brainstorm and talk about kind of challenges or how your state has um, addressed you know, nuclear and new nuclear applications in particular. Um, so first off, I will now send, um, turn things over um, to Ashley Finnan. She's the director of the National Reactor Innovation Center. Great, thank you very much, Jessica. Can you hear me? Yep, sound okay, good. Great. Just let me share. So while I get my slides off, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Um, I'm gonna give a brief overview of what's on the horizon and a little bit of an overview of advanced nuclear. I'm gonna keep it as, as non-technical um, as possible and focus on the key attributes of advanced nuclear, what it can do for us and when it's coming and what we're doing to, to bring it to commercial reality. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt or, or I'm gonna try to leave some time for questions at the end and then we'll have the discussion period. Um, as, as Jessica introduced, I'm the director of the National Reactor Innovation Center at Idaho National Laboratory. Um, NREC, for short, is a national DOE-NE program. Um, we're centered at INL, but working across the country with many different labs to help advance um, nuclear demonstrations. Um, so with that, I'll go to the next slide. Just looking at US advanced reactor technologies at a high level, they're generally categorized in terms of capacity. We have micro reactors that are smaller than 10 megawatt electric, um, and then small reactors in the 10 to 300 megawatt range, and medium and large reactors more along the size of what we have today in our current fleet, going up to around a gigawatt per unit. Um, so there's, there's really a um, wealth of, of companies that are pursuing these technologies now a diverse set of technologies, a diverse set of sizes in order to serve diverse markets. Um, they're pursuing a variety of different coolants and, oops, I'm not sure why that advanced, sorry. Um, th those include gases, sodium, salt, lead, and water. Um, the, the coolants aren't all that important, I don't think for our purposes. The reason that those different coolants are being pursued is to achieve 
advanced characteristics in terms of energy efficiency or safety or the ability to apply to, to non-electric applications. Um, they're all good approaches and different approaches to the same goal, which is innovation in nuclear and serving new markets and um, society's needs as we move forward. Um, in terms of the market, there, that includes looking at very small applications, niche applications in remote communities or in mining applications, um, all the way up to central generation for baseload power. Um, and a lot of things in between, including planning for integrated energy systems where renewables and nuclear balance one another um, and also work with the industrial processes that we need to, to decarbonize um, and to power as we transition to, to cleaner energy sources. Um, all of the advanced reactors are targeting improved economics, improved safety, waste, and security profiles. I, I'm not sure whether you covered this in the first session or whether all of you were in the first session. So this is just a really quick reminder of, of why this matters. Why do we care about advanced nuclear? Um, this is one reason, there are a lot of reasons, but, but this is the clean energy case for advanced nuclear in a, um, an example case where a study um, for Energy Northwest looked at how to achieve 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045. Um, and essentially, the, the first bar in this, the first column in this chart shows the, the total installed capacity required to achieve 100% carbon free um, if you rely solely on renewable energy sources. So um, hydro, solar, wind, storage, um, that, that sort of set of sources. The second bar shows what you get if you do a license extension on the Columbia Generating Station. So that adds about 1.2 gigawatts of nuclear um, and reduces your, your overall capacity burden somewhat. The third bar or, or column rather shows you the total installed capacity if you include just six and a half gigawatts of, um, of nuclear. So Columbia Generating Station plus a, a little over four gigawatts of new small modular reactors. And you can see that by adding the, the six and a half gigawatts of firm zero carbon electricity, you end up avoiding 91 gigawatts of, of variable installed capacity. You're still installing a lot of wind and a lot of solar, but not, not, as, much as, not as much storage or variable capacity as in the prior cases. I don't know why my slides are advancing without me, sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, and that reduces cost by up to $8 billion per year. So it's an, it's an enormous impact to, to have this zero carbon firm energy available. And this is a key reason that this is important. Um, another reason is that we even need to look beyond electricity and we need to look at the industrial system and how we're going to power transportation um, and a variety of other processes as we look to deep decarbonization. So this is a, a cartoon um, but the point here is that nuclear reactors can provide heat and they can provide electricity and steam. And those can be used in various ways to provide hydrogen, to provide clean fuels. And you'll hear, um, I think Marilyn Cray speak about hydrogen production that's going on right now. Sorry about this. It's um, must be on a timer somehow. It's trying to keep me moving along. Um, and um, so, um, You'll hear from Marilyn about hydrogen production, but there are innovators looking at all of these industrial processes. And in fact, um, nuclear is used all over the world for desalination and some of these other applications, including district heating. Um, so a lot of opportunity here, and this can be coupled with renewable generators as well to balance the uh, energy demand. A little bit of historical context. Um, to, to what we have going on today is that we had reactor demonstration programs in the past, um, including work at the National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho, where the nation built 52 reactors over a period of 25 years in a, a time of rapid innovation. Um, the Cooperative Power Reactor Demonstration Program, we, we built about a dozen reactors in as many years. Again, those were public-private partnerships and a period of rapid demonstration and innovation. Recently, we have policy actions that prepare us to see that kind of burst of innovation, demonstration, and commercialization again in the nuclear sector. 
um, with the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act and several other important um, policy actions. So in short, we've done this before, and this is the EBR2 dome on the right, which housed the reactor in the, the 60s to the 90s. Um, and we're going to do it again. And, and one of the things that ENRIC, my organization is working on is taking that EBR2 dome and refurbishing it and preparing it to host demonstration reactors again. It won't look quite as, as extravagant as this, this um, uh, image, but it will host demonstration reactors and allow us to demonstrate quickly by the end of 2025. So the US government has done a lot to support um, this movement from concepts of advanced reactors to commercial products that can be used in the market and really um, serve the needs of, of your states. Um, and these are not all of the DOE efforts, but there's some selected efforts that I wanted to highlight. One is the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, which has uh, it's a public-private partnership that the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy has with 10 different projects that have been awarded, four of which include demonstration projects, two commercial demonstrations and two earlier stage uh, demonstrations that are pre-commercial and also some efforts in there to establish some fuel supply. Um, we also have additional microreactor demonstrations outside of that. There are some private sector demonstrations somewhat independent of DOE, but also a very small microreactor called Marvel being built at INL as a test platform. Um, and then several DOD and NASA projects that will demonstrate microreactors. So a lot of opportunity to, to see these projects at the market um, and, and you know, be available for, for purchase in the coming years. The National Reactor Innovation Center and the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear are both national programs set up to support innovators and their stakeholders moving towards commercialization. Um, and in particular, I mentioned that EBR2 project that we have, which we're calling the ENRIC Dome. Um, and that represents a demonstration platform in which demonstration reactors can be operated, removed, and then a new one can come in and be operated and removed to prove that these reactors um, perform as we expect them to. Then the Advanced Construction Technology Initiative is another element of the ENRIC program where we're working to take some technologies that are used in other industries and demonstrate them in a nuclear context because they can have a transformative impact on construction costs and construction schedule. And that includes some innovative approaches largely to civil engineering, to excavation and to, to um, building a structure with steel bricks instead of um, a, a concrete pour. Um, also a, a lot of implementation of digital engineering, digital twins and advanced sensors that will make the construction and, and inspection process run more smoothly. Um, and then integrated energy systems are really critical to demonstrating how we get to a zero carbon grid and a zero carbon energy system that is as efficient as it can be um, and makes the best use of each of the, the many contributors to our energy supply. Oops, I guess my pictures are coming up. And then I just wanted to show you, this isn't comprehensive, but these are a number of the demonstration projects that we see coming between now and 2030. Um, and again, it, it doesn't include all of them, but you can see that we have a lot of projects coming, um, a lot of reactors that we expect will be built in this next decade, um, some of them in the next half decade. So there's a lot going on in this space and it is not a, it, it is not a someday, it's, it's like a tomorrow kind of a um, situation. So at ENRIC, our mission is to inspire stakeholders and the public to empower innovators by um, enabling them to have access to the facilities, the expertise, and the materials at the national laboratories, and to deliver successful outcomes through efficient coordination of partners and resources. And we really see these as being related because as we're able to empower innovators and deliver those results, I think that that, that will captivate and inspire the people who are looking to advance nuclear to help us reach our energy goals, um, but want to see it actually happen. Like they need to see it real, um, not in theory. So we're, we're getting to concrete reactors. Um, and I think um, I'll breeze through this in, in view of 
time, but these are a few of the things we're doing to empower innovators. Um, we're really trying to help them move from concept to demonstration so that they're ready to sell into the commercial market down the road. Um, we have a demonstration resource network of test beds and demonstration sites. We're developing key experimental and fuel facilities that are needed, and we're, we're building those. We're not, we're not thinking about it. Those are, some of those are under construction. Um, we're doing a lot of work on regulatory risk reduction, both with the DOE and the NRC, and with respect to the National Environmental Policy Act process. Uh, we're doing modeling and simulation work with a virtual test bed, and we have an NRIC resource team that helps innovators get quick um, and efficient access to experts at the labs to help them move at the speed of business. And then I wanna just emphasize again, addressing costs and markets. So I, I mentioned the advanced construction technologies. Um, at NRIC, we have a, a first project that where we're partnering with GE Hitachi and a number of partners to demonstrate this advanced vertical shaft boring technology that can decrease the cost of excavation, um, as well as some steel bricks and digital twin technologies. We're doing a lot of work to bring digital engineering into the advanced nuclear sector because it is used with great success elsewhere. Um, in, in fact, the Air Force brought their sixth generation stealth fighter to flight about 10 years ahead of schedule um, based largely on the success of digital engineering. So it can make a big difference in how quickly we move and, and how we reduce errors. Um, but we need to get that into the, the nuclear sector. Um, and then integrated energy systems, I've mentioned the importance of that. And I just wanna take a minute to talk about repowering opportunities. Um, and I think of this not as just repowering, retiring um, generation units, but really repowering communities because as large generation units move towards retirement, those communities can really suffer from the loss of that big um, economic driver. So we have a great example of how this can work in Wyoming, where the natrium demonstration reactor is planned to be built at the site of a retiring coal plant. Um, and we've been working with Wyoming and with TerraPower to, to support the engagement around that project. But I think that's just one emblematic example of an opportunity that exists across the country. So we have um, coal plants really throughout the United States. Um, that present an opportunity. We also have retiring nuclear units in the coming decades. Um, and after those, we'll have retiring gas units that similarly will need to be repowered. Um, and, and actually in the next decade, um, about 100 gigawatts of coal plants are, are expected to retire. So it's an enormous economic opportunity. Um, if, we, if we take hold of it, and, and I think you'll hear from some of the panelists um, about this opportunity later. But I just wanna emphasize how important advanced nuclear could be to repowering these communities. Um, and then finally, I'll just close by saying NREC is a, a national program and a central integrator. We wanna help, um, help all of the resources of the federal government and the private sector work together to make these projects a success. So um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm, I'm happy to take questions and look forward to working with anyone who would like to engage on this in the future. Thank you, Ashley. And if folks have questions, you can either type them into the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself and jump in with a question or raise your hand, um, feel free to do so. But there's already a question that just came in um, in the chat. So um, the questions about Canada being a front runner and advanced nuclear, um, and they have, let me scroll down. A, it's kind of more of a, a 27 point national action plan to demonstrate and deploy SMR reactor technology by 2025, 26. How difficult will it be for US policymakers to recognize the essential need for low or no carbon nuclear energy? Well, I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, Canada does have an aggressive plan. The UK also has an aggressive plan. I think that countries across the world are recognizing this. Um, and we, we heard a lot about it at, at the um, COP26 over the last week. I think there's a, a growing recognition. There's bipartisan support in the US for this. And I, I think that actually the United States has one of the, the most robust programs largely through the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. Um, 
to demonstrate the technology. Perhaps when we move towards deployment, there's still more work to be done, but on demonstration, the United States is in, um, in a leading position here. Um, and I think it's a good sign that there are so many people from, from this group interested in this topic. You, you must be here because you recognize that nuclear has an important role um, or that it might. So I appreciate that question. And then we have a question David has his hand raised. David, if you want to jump in and ask the next question, Ashley too is going to be sticking around for our just state only discussions at sessions. So she'll be at least in one of the groups too and can answer for further questions um, later on. Okay, thank you. Um, I have kind of a general question. I, like probably many people on in the audience, um, I'm cautiously enthusiastic and interested in in the potential for nuclear power to address some of our questions or, or challenges in the future. But I also am, I'm going to have to face a lot of people in um, our state who are have big doubts. And the more you can help us to uh, provide information that is um, clear and unbiased about the problems and challenges, the better we will be able to answer the questions. And let me give you a specific. Um, I'm, I'm an engineer and I've been in construction for 30 years. I don't believe there's such a thing as a zero carbon technology. And I've noticed that other countries refer to low carbon technologies, which seems more realistic to me. And I guess that's my question is, is it more realistic to talk about low carbon? Yeah, that's a that's a really high level question. And I don't disagree with you. I mean, on, on the, it's merits right now, we aren't zero carbon because some of the early, some of the life cycle emissions, we're still using as long as we're still using carbon somewhere, it gets into everything. It kind of, um, it kind of seeps in. Um, the, and I've, I've struggled with this in my career, feeling like maybe we should call it low carbon. But the trouble is that if solar and wind are called zero carbon and nuclear decides to be more, um, more accurate and call itself low carbon, now nuclear looks like it has more carbon than solar and wind, when in fact it doesn't. And in, in most, cases it has, it has, most cases it has less. So I think we would have to agree to, to do that on a whole economy-wide level. But ultimately, um, if we do do a full decarbonization of our economy, we can get to zero carbon. We can get to where either we're removing the carbon we're using or all of our um, energy that goes into the life cycle is zero carbon. So I think we can get there. And, and I think either way is fine, to be honest. But on the communication um, front, please, um, maybe I'll try to reach out to you, David. I'm, I'm happy to try to help however we can. We are doing a lot of work in that space, both trying to understand best practices um, and to develop engagement um, tools, but would be really interested in hearing um, what what you think you need for, for your audiences and your stakeholders. Thank you. Um, and I know we're out of time, but Richard, if you want to type your question to Ashley in the chat, um, maybe she can answer it during the next session, but I will turn things over to my colleague, um, Timothy Schoenhoven. Hi everyone, uh, this is Timothy Schoenhoven. Uh, thanks again for all of you for, for joining today. At this point, we're going to transition into our uh, panel discussion. We're very, very excited to have some really fantastic folks here uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, that we're, and we're very, we're very fortunate to be able to give this afternoon to hear some voices who are um, really putting together some great work that we're excited for uh, the chance to hear more about and uh, get a chance for you all to ask questions of some folks that are developing and deploying pr uh, projects like. Um, so I'll start off by introducing the panel sort of as a whole and then we'll go, uh, each one of them will have a chance to sort of make some opening introductions about their work before we go into a group discussion. So we've got Marilyn from Exelon uh, for the utility perspective joining us uh, this afternoon, and then Adam Demela is coming to us from GE Hitachi, and Carol Lane from X Energy. So we all have the utility, and then we'll have two of the nuclear development companies with us. Um, so I'll start by turning things over to Marilyn uh, to, to kick us off uh, with sharing some about the work that Exelon is doing. Great. Uh, thank you, Timothy. And it's always tough uh, following Ashley. 
Um, but I'll say we are grateful not only for Enric and the establishment of that entity, but also for Ashley's leadership in that area, because he is, as you can tell, there's so much activity going on with respect to new reactors that we truly do need somebody to inspire and, um, and, and coordinate all of that. So if you go to the next slide, I wanted to share just kind of a current overview from an Exelon perspective. Our objectives are to preserve our current fleet. Exelon operates 21 units within the United States, and we will continue to run and operate them safely. But we are also looking towards the future. So we are looking to foster the development and the commercialization of the advanced designs. And kind of picking up um, on some of the things that Ashley mentioned, we absolutely see the role of nuclear plants expanding, certainly for the new reactors, but also for the existing ones. And so much of that is linked back to the critical component that nuclear serves in decarbonization goals. And Exelon, who has customers, we are seeing that from some of our large industrial customers who are looking to say, how do I get, you know, I want to go, I have decarbonization goals, I want to be clean. There are states, obviously you're well uh, more familiar with that than I am, but then we're also seeing countries establish those goals. And the COP26 is certainly the forum for all of that. And within that, the renewables are clearly a very needed component for these, oh, this decarbonization strategy, but the nu nuclear power can pair very nicely with renewables as it will serve as this enabling foundation upon which to build out renewables. So um, flexible generation, that's a low following. I think typically um, folks as, as the, being the operator, we thought of our plan certainly as base load, but it is on and on 24 seven, but we have the ability to load follow and we have been doing it at our Exelon plants and some of the newer designs are will have even more agility there. Integration with enter energy storage, whether you're looking at batteries or fuel cells or even some other type of molten salt loop to store that energy when the grid doesn't need it. Ashley mentioned desalinization and district heating applications. Those are certainly there in hydro produ hydrogen production, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the other thing that's been getting a lot of attention recently is behind the meter co-location with large loads. And that is some large loads, if you look at data centers or any, any of these loads that consume a large amount of electricity are exploring the option of what if they were to co-locate that facility and be behind the meter. There are potentially financial benefits associated with it, but some of the ones that we're hearing is for them to make their claim to be green, they um, if they have a direct connection with a green provider such as um, a nuclear power plant, that is, um, that, that is their preferred piece at that point. So there is just so much activity that is going on, again, beyond what used to be just making electricity 24 seven. And I have that takeaway at the bottom because the current fleet of reactors is needed to sustain this momentum because the manufacturing supply chain within the US and also the pipeline of human resources we need our current plans to kind of continue that to help usher in this next generation of reactors because um, nuclear supply chain and human resources availability ranging from our welders and craft workers all the way up to our nuclear fuels engineers they're always um, they are uh, difficult um, to 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 procure if you go to the next slide um, our ex our reason for interest is that we want to influence these designs. So we are working with a number of the manufacturers in, including the two that you're going to hear about as far, as far as sharing our operational expertise. And that's to ensure that we have alternatives for the future. One of the biggest reasons, however, is because of all those different uses, we see them being sold to a much broader list of customers beyond your large uh, utility such as Exelon. And that creates a business opportunity for us to share and provide our operational services to these new owners who might not otherwise want to um, have a nuclear power facility if they did not have assistance in operating it. It also communicates our long-term commitment to nuclear. We're going to run our current fleet safely for as long as we can, and then we'd like to operate the next fleet as well. 
So we are engaging, as I mentioned, with a number of reactor developers and leading the industry forums. If you go to the next slide, I think touching on some of the things Ashley mentioned, you know, there is a wide range of advanced reactor developers, and that's quite different than if you looked at who were the designers beyond the fleet that we have currently. There really just was a handful of, of, of three or four of them. Now you're looking at it uh, where we're, we're certainly have the advantage of so many different companies of so many different sizes that are out there developing uh, new reactors with different uh, some are startup companies and some have been around and in the business for a long time. Certainly see some big advantages. Overall cost is lower, meaning these are much smaller reactors. So the overall cost, which means it does not break a balance sheet the way perhaps a dual unit of a large uh, light water reactor would be. Um, some enhanced construction, enhanced safety. As I mentioned, ability to uh, move about on the grid is better. And then also the flexible um, operations. The challenges, which again, we're so grateful for the DOE and other programs, NRIC gain and the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. The challenges are, it's difficult right now to quantify with much certainty what the final cost is going to be because the designs are, are not necessarily mature enough to to lend it to that type of um, that type of estimation regulatory approvals are still uncertain we're looking at a lot of different designs which are new for our regulator but there's a lot of cooperation and collaboration between the industry and the nuclear regulatory commission to essentially adjust that framework and and then the funding streams these you know some developers they all have different funding streams but it 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 is um it is a a costly thing to design a new reactor and then just want to use the the just a couple of last minutes to talk about our project of our hydrogen on the next slide um as i mentioned we have 21 reactors and um we have two reactors um up in new york on lake ontario nine mile point so under a DOE program, we are looking to install a one megawatt electrolyzer. And an electrolyzer is basically the technology that you would use if you take water and you split it using electricity, you split it into its hydrogen and its oxygen components. So that's fundamentally what it does. So we, it will supply the hydrogen to our plants because nuclear power plants consume hydrogen. So we can provide that. We'll also be looking at simulating scaling up operation of it and also looking at the economics associated with using the electricity from the nine mile plant to power the electrolyzer. Again, when grid prices are low, send that electricity to the electrolyzer when grid prices are high then it would all go to the grid. So that is part of the analysis that we are, are doing. You can see some of the timeline of the dates there and how we selected, you know, just, just so many learnings in here as far as how we select the um, our, our site. And it's not only does it have the real estate, is it suitable for this, but we're also looking on end users, you know, because hydrogen, there's generation, there's the storage, the transportation and the end users. So that whole new ecosystem is something that we as the US, as states in the US need to be exploring. You can see some of our partners that are there, including of course, Idaho National Lab, as well as Argonne National Lab. The next slide, that's really just a, just a kind of overview of some of the end, end users. In the interest of time, I wanted to kind of close with um, uh, Timothy and Jessica had asked for, you know, some of the state policy, what messaging um, would be given to those. So if you go to the, uh, the very last slide there, um, first of all, the advanced reactors, they need the similar to the same policies that the existing reactors need. And so there have been some recent actions in the states that have taken to support nuclear. That includes um, Illinois, New Jersey, and New York. They've acted, enacted very comprehensive clean energy or zero emission credit legislation to help preserve that existing fleet. Pennsylvania is um, completing the regulatory process to join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, the REGI, that will allow uh, Pennsylvania to support existing nuclear units and provide funding for clean energy technologies. Montana, uh, recently passed legislation removing a provision that required a state-wide um, referendum on nuclear. Um, and also Nebraska has approved legislation that will allow for the production of electricity from nuclear to qualify for tax incentives. Again, very important with respect to the overall 
economic um, business case for, for nuclear. And then um, states are looking or repealing nuclear siting moratoriums. So it's hard to imagine those are still on the books, but those are being repealed, which will allow for the development of new technologies. And then lastly, the uh, federal and state partnerships in support of development for hydrogen technologies. We are the beneficiary for that in the state of um, uh, New York through the DOE program, as, as well as um, other applications. So I'll close with that and turn it back to you, Timothy. Thanks so much, Marilyn. Uh, really appreciate all the fantastic information and getting to see what you all are uh, doing. Um, for the sake of time, I'll turn it right back over to Adam and Mella from GE Hitachi to talk about their work. All right, great. First off, I'd like to say thanks to Timothy and to Jessica for putting this together. It's uh, it's certainly an important topic, and um, I know that these things aren't often easy to organize. Second, I'd like to thank all the folks in the audience. Um, everybody's busy, and when you take your time to listen to important topics like this, it makes a big difference. And then, and then finally, to Ashley and her colleagues at the Department of Energy, you know, I, a lot of this stuff just doesn't happen without federal support, and that federal support isn't just dollars, but it's people thinking about policy and direction and the kinds of things we need to do. The Department of Energy of today is vastly different than the Department of Energy of five or 10 years ago, and that's especially clear in the nuclear area. So um, what I'd like to do today is just give you a little tiny bit of background about me, a little bit of uh, my view of how nuclear power can meet our goals of the future, and then the things that my, at least my company is doing in those spaces. Uh, I'm a little bit biased about nuclear, and it's, it's not because I work for GE Hitachi, it's probably the other way around. My bias came at a young age when someone told me you could put as much energy in a marble of uranium as you could in a ton of coal, okay? Um, that got worse or better depending on your perspective when I had a, a mentor who once told me, don't go to college to get a job, go to college to pursue a career. Now, when you're 18, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, and so I went off to become a nuclear engineer. As I was in school, studying, I had more than more than enough people tell me that, you know, I, I was entering a field that was dying. You know, what are you doing, kid? Go study electrical, go study uh, mechanical, go study something else. And, and uh, you know, again and again and again, I heard nuclear is dying. What I later discovered was nuclear wasn't dying. Um, it was really, it was hibernating, okay? And, and so the way I think about it is, is nuclear has woken up. Okay, when, when I was in college, nuclear power provided about 20% of our electricity. Um, we haven't really added very much, almost no capacity or generating capa capacity to nuclear since then, and yet we're still delivering 20% today. So that tells you something about the longevity of nuclear. Uh, it continues to be the, the predominant source of, I'll say, low carbon power, um, and, and it's... Um, you know, it is certainly our base load for non-carbon power, okay? The question really is, what do we do now? And Ashley said, you know, real, not theory. What I say is, let's stop talking and let's start doing, okay? And there's really four areas that I think we have to focus on. And, and they're, they're somewhat sequential. One is the immediate. One is the near term. One is the midterm. And the other one is the thing that we should be doing all the time. And so the immediate is we have to maintain our existing fleet. We just have to do it. Um, you know, it's, we, we have different markets and different uh, ways that co power is, is uh, costed and that creates some unnatural uh, powers in the, in the market. And that creates some pressure on certain nuclear plants and others have different scenarios. But the bottom line is we need to do everything we can to maintain them. One of the things that you see lately is states are providing incentives you see that uh, on the federal lever, level, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure package that just passed in the House, that includes $6 billion for uh, civil engineering credits. You know, those are the kinds of things that five years ago you never would have imagined, right? Now, at a more local level, what are we doing about it at GE? We do a lot of maintenance outage work, refueling work. We make fuel for refuelings. And in all those areas, we're working to reduce the downtime, the down cycles. We work to improve the fuel so that there's um, you know, more reliability, lower cost, better performance. We're also working a DOE funded program for accident tolerant fuels. You know, and the idea there again is greater reliability, greater predictability, greater margins, um, and ultimately lower cost. 
The second thing that we need to do in the near term is we need to add more nuclear generation to the grid. When I say near term, I'm talking about this decade. And when I think about what can we do in this decade, I'm thinking about Gen 3 plus small modular reactors, right? And that's a very, you know, it's a lot of syllables there. But what does that mean? It means systems that are based on existing designs, but better. Um, generally, they're based on water as their moderator and their coolant. They generally have fuel that we're familiar with or we've used before. Um, and and, system, and, and they're, because they're small and they're modular, and Ashley spoke about this as well, we've got some new ways that we can build those that make them more cost effective. It's less time to build, it costs less money to build, and because it takes less time to build, they're generating power and bringing in revenue much sooner. For us at GE Hitachi, we're working to deliver the first small modular reactor in Canada in 2028 and, and plan to deliver the first one in the United States as, as soon as a year after that. Plus we're working in Europe with partners um, to do a, a lot more delivery shortly thereafter. Um, our design is called the BWRX 300. It is a simplified design. It is a, it is a smaller and simplified design of a reactor we already have licensed. It takes advantage of these modern techniques that I've talked about. It uses a fuel that's already in production. Um, it doesn't rely on HALU, which is a problem that we in the nuclear field have to deal with for all of our gen, for most of our Gen 4 reactors. So we're pretty excited about, about BWRX 300. The thing I think we need to do in the midterm is gonna be deliver Gen 4 reactors. We have to demonstrate that those Gen 4 reactors are ready and we have to demonstrate that they can deliver on the promises that we're making people because you know, we, we get a lot of question and a lot of skeptics about, you know, can you really build it cheaper? Can it be safer? Can it do all the load following that you say it can? Um, most people don't realize when we talk about advanced reactors, most of the ideas and concepts that we're talking about, we built and operated in the 50s and 60s. Um, they're not new. The, the difference is today we get to bring modern manufacturing techniques. We're able to analyze things we never could before. Um, you know, just the way we build and operate today is different and we take all those things in and put them to our advantage. In this case, we are one of the, uh, we are on one of the teams under that advanced reactors demonstration program that's been mentioned. We're partnered with TerraPower to deliver that natrium reactor in, in Wyoming that, that Ashley mentioned as well. And we're pretty excited about the, about the opportunity. And the last one is the thing that we should be doing all along and always, right? Which is, um, you know, I hate to use the word infrastructure because living in Washington, D.C., I don't know what infrastructure means anymore. But in, in this context, um, I'm talking about, you know, not only facilities, but also the people that do the work. I'm talking about um, inspiring our workforce of the future. I'm talking about research and development capabilities. And so when, when a community hosts a new, a new nuclear reactor, they're making a 60 to 80 to 100 year endeavor. And, but that also means it's, you know, 60 to 80 to 100 years worth of good paying jobs. It means that we need uh, training. It means that we need research capability because we have to keep improving over time. We have to keep learning. And I, I could talk for a long, long time about all the things we can do in this topic. The one I'll talk about that we're working on is, again, we're a partner on the versatile test reactor. Uh, we're doing that for the Department of Energy in the Idaho National Lab, also with some other industry partners. When that is delivered, it'll be a fast test reactor that will help our Gen 4 reactors continue to progress through their lifetimes. I'll just end on that and say we have a lot of work in front of us. It's an exciting time, but, but we really do need to act. Thanks, Evan. I really appreciate sure. that overview and appreciate you making the time to be here with us uh, today. Uh, before we get back to qu questions for, for the panel, we have uh, Carol Lane from X Energy, who's going to round out the panel, and then we will have uh, a couple minutes of dialogue with everyone together before we go into our state breakout. So Carol, uh, you can take it away. Thanks. Before we go to the next slide, I just want to make two comments. I do want to thank the National Government Association for inviting me and X Energy to participate in this panel today. And two is I really would like to recognize um, Adam for his contribution, particularly in his um, focus on, as he said, his philosophy of let's get let's start doing. And um, as I think some of you know, maybe not everybody, he was on the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee prior to um, his current position, and he was very, very 
focused on we've got to get these react these reactors demonstrated. So he deserves a lot of credit for um, actually making um, you know sort of moving us along to where we are today. So uh, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so X Energy is a nuclear um, design and fuel manufacturing company that was actually started in 2009. Um, when I joined in, in 2015, we were about 12 people. We're now up to uh, topping about uh, 240 people. We've hired 140 people um, since COVID. So um, and I'll, a lot of that was due to our award that we received in October of 2020 for the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, but just to sort of set a context, um, we see ourselves in four business areas. So the first is the XE100 reactor, which is our grid scale um, reactor uh, that we are demonstrating in our uh, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. We also have a contract with the Department of Defense for a mobile reactor. It's a one megawatt reactor. Um, and so it's got a whole different approach in terms of the flexibility of how a nuclear reactor could be used. Um, about five years ago, we decided that fuel was such a cr critical element of our reactor that we wanted to be in control of our own destiny. So we have been investing as well as partnering with DOE and DOE's investment um, to develop a triso fuel capability. And I'll show you a little bit of what our, we have a pilot pilot, excuse me, facility that we have been operating since 2016 at Oak Ridge National Lab. And as part of the ARDP program, we will be building a commercial scale manufacturing facility. And then finally, we find between all of our reactors and the use of triso fuel, um, for those of you that might be interested, we think there are some space applications and we're working both with NASA and DOD on those. So, um, uh, it's a pretty exciting time and we have a lot of growth areas for our nuclear application. Um, next slide. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about our fuel because it's different than what you might be used to. This um, pebble um, is actually our containment vessel and it's really the core of our safety case. And, um, it really, it is uh, made of graphite. It's about the size of a billiard ball. And inside this pebble is about 17,000 um, particles that are about the size of chia seeds. And the uranium is actually contained in those chia seeds and coated with um, three layers and a buffer layer of silicon carbide. And, um, and then these 17,000 pebbles are embedded into this um, pebble. And so um, that's a very different way. It, prov it provides a different safety case for nuclear energy than has really been done in the past. Although I will say that these reactors are not new. Um, there have been um, high temperature gas pool reactors, pebble bed reactors um, built in the past. And, um, but we're doing it in a different way and in an innovative way and a smaller capacity to make them more affordable and more flexible in terms of their application. This fuel has been tested over the past five or 10 years at Idaho National Lab. It retains 99.999% of the fission material. And, um, and that's why Department of Energy has called it the ro most robust fuel on earth. Um, if you go to the next slide, as I said, these um, pebbles are actually put into the core of the reactor. Um, you can think of it as a giant gumball machine. And then helium versus water is flowed over the pebbles. The helium heats up, generates, um, and becomes heated, superheated, goes into um, the steam generator and the turbine and generates either steam or electricity. So a um, very different process. Um, and, and you know, provides a different look at and risks associated with safety. Um, we use about one-tenth of the components of a traditional light water reactor. Um, as I said, this technology is not new. And I just wanted to mention that yesterday, in fact, the Chinese have just commissioned their high temperature pebble bed reactor. 
And um, this is very concerning because as we go forward with um, advanced nuclear energy, we do think it's very important that we um, rebuild back our U.S. leadership in um, uh, our U.S. leadership in nuclear energy. And, and Adam just talked about some of the reasons in terms of foreign policy issues and nonproliferation um, are very important elements as we look to the future of nuclear energy. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our advanced reactor demonstration program will be built in Washington. And why did we pick the state of Washington? It's because they passed a state law in 2019, the Clean Air Transformation Act. And basically it said they had to get off coal by 2026 and they had to have a zero carbon grid by 2045. And they went out, hired an independent firm to look at how do they make that up. Um, they're currently about 40% hydro, 25% um, of their energy is um, coal and natural gas. And the rest, they have one nuclear plant, which is about 5%. And then the rest is um, wind and solar. So basically the report came back and said, if they're gonna meet their energy goals in terms of generation, they really needed to add new nuclear capacity. Um, so that, that was the reason the timing worked out with the Department of Energy's um, goal of getting a plant deployed by 2027, and that met their needs in terms of meeting, um, getting their energy online. Um, so that's why we are in the state of Washington. Next slide, please. Um, we've made a lot of progress, and this is just to give you a little bit of feel. The, slot, the picture on the left is our fuel fabrication pilot facility down in Oak Ridge. So we're actually making triso particles and pebbles and testing them now. Um, and then this on the right is at our facility in Rockville. It's a operations simulation room um, where you can see we've got the four modules up on the screens of the front and then three operators that are operating the reactor facility. So if any of you wanna to come to our facility, we welcome having visitors and showing you what we, uh, what we can do. And we even have a virtual reality tool we're using for maintenance so you can kind of walk around the reactor and, and see what's inside the reactor um, building itself and even inside the core. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a feel, this is our site um, on the left out at, um, in Washington at Tri-Cities. Um, in the middle, you see a, an artist rendition of what that might look like after they've had a lot of rain out there in uh, Washington. Uh, next slide. Um, I just wanted to comment, I think Ashley hit on this a little bit. You know, um, I wanted to make three points about um, nuclear energy and base load and it, its ability to partner with wind and solar. The first is that our reactor can load follow. Um, it can actually go from 100% down to 40% in about 15 minutes and back up in that period of time. This um, ability to ramp up and ramp down like that gives a lot of flexibility to the utilities um, as they bring on renewables and you know, uh, look at the flexibility they need in their power grids. Um, the second, um, and I think this was referred to a little bit earlier too, where coal plants are retiring, um, which is primarily in the Midwest, the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic area where a lot of domination of that is, is not necessarily the ideal places for wind and solar, um, which is really in the Great Plains and the, and the West. And so you have a bit of a mismatch between as you're swapping out um, some of the coal uh, facilities or retiring coal facilities for next generation power. And so nuclear becomes a very interesting option for that. Um, I know in the state of Maryland, for example, where you look at land use, um, nuclear density becomes a very important factor. Um, I was told by somebody in the state of Maryland, which has a, a several retiring coal plants coming up, that to replace that plant with solar capacity would take 56 square miles. That's an awful lot of land in a state that small. So it's going to be a very, you know a, a a complex set of issues that go into what's the right energy mix to replace some of these um, assets that we're retiring. Uh, next slide. 
So I just wanted to close, I think we're hopefully leaving enough time for questions with talking about, I, I mentioned energy density, um, I'm gonna talk about the power of a pebble. A pebble produces 27.4 megawatt hours of electricity. Um, you can see it would power 28 Maryland homes for a month or would power an electric vehicle um, to be able to go about 98,000 miles. That's four times the circumference of, uh, of the earth or two thirds of the way to the moon. So with that, um, I'll just close and glad to answer any questions.